Over there. Let's get a wave. Everyone's learning everything, a lot of stuff at the conference, aren't you? Yeah? What, what have you learned? Financing for energy projects, that's a good thing to learn about. I've learned uh, about ampimeters, I've learned about a number of things, but I'll tell you the most important thing I've learned today, and I want to see a show of hands from the rest of you, is when you wake up tonight in the middle of the night and you say, I'm sleeping like a dolphin, are you going to be puzzling over what is a dolphin doing up at that time of night? I mean, who else is going to have that fixated in your mind. So we all thank Cheryl for telling us that we sleep like dolphins. Thank you, Cheryl. My name is Joel Niemeyer. I'm the federal co-chair for the Denali Commission. I'm moderating today's presentation. We're getting started a bit late, and we want to leave a little bit of time uh, uh, before 1.30 so you can get on to your next session. I was asked to give a little bit of an introduction about what the Denali Commission is doing with the new presidential assignment on environmentally threatened communities. And so uh, allow me to speak on that for about five minutes, and then I'll introduce our uh, featured speaker for the uh, luncheon. So we all live in Alaska, yes? And we all have seen climate change as it's been occurring. I can tell you that when I go to the lower 48, I view everyone in the lower 48 as a climate change skeptic. Not because they don't believe in the causes, it's because they just haven't seen it. They haven't seen, like, you know, I, this, this winter, I don't even know if I wore gloves at all this winter. I was talking with uh, representatives from the community of Shishram. They've, they've said they've never heard waves crashing in November. That's a foreign concept for them. So we're all seeing it. So I don't need to tell you that it's going on. We all know it's going on. But this is about a story about how the federal government has been noticing it. So in um, 2005, I believe, Senator Stevens got funding for the Army Corps of Engineers to do a study on erosion effects in rural Alaska. They produced a fine report and then Congress then asked Government Accountability Office to do some further research. And GAO came away and said, limited progress has been made in relocating villages threatened by flooding and erosion. They identified 31 communities. These are the 31 that were identified by the Army Corps as the most threatened. And let's talk about that. Of the 31, four of them are talking about village relocation. That's Shishmarif, Shaktula, Kivalina, and Newtok. And of the remaining 31, the 27 are talking about protect and place strategies. Earlier today, I've seen, um, uh, is Nathan here, Nathan Hill? Well, Nathan talked about in uh, Port Hyde and how they had to move some bulk fuel farms. The uh, bulk fuel farm was built by AEA. Denali Commission provided some funding for it. This was less than 15 years ago. And they had to move it last year because of erosion. So the 27 communities, there are real issues facing them. And then we have everyone else. We call them the vulnerable. And we don't know what's going on there, but I think what's important to note is of that vulnerable includes Galena. And we know what happened to Galena two years ago. So there is a great deal of risk and threat out there. So the president, as you probably all know, assigned the Denali Commission a role. We are the lead coordinating agency, not the lead implementing agency. We are to coordinate the family of federal agencies to find solutions, both short and long term, solutions for these environmental threats. Again, I want to come back to that. We are the coordinating, not implementing. The idea is, is that the other agencies, through their existing appropriation authorities or uh, through other sources, would be able to develop those implemented implementation strategies. Our role is to look at infrastructure that's threatened, threatened by permafrost degradation, flooding, or the aforementioned erosion. And through this process, uh, we are under the watchful eye of the Arctic Executive Steering Committee. Now, the Arctic Executive Steering Committee was set uh, in place in January of 2015 uh, by executive order. Wait a minute. Yes, I got that right, 15. And um, 
what they will do is they'll watch what we're doing. So we're sort of the, the Alaska-based agency and we'll be reporting back to DC on the solutions. But the real reason why I asked to talk to you today is that uh, we have published this week in the Federal Register what our proposed funding plan is for FY16. I'd encourage you to go to the Federal Register. You can Google it and then you type in Denali Commission and up will pop uh, our proposed investment plan for FY16, of which included these, fun these funds. As you can see, we're proposing the vast majority of our funds for environmentally threatened communities to go to the four communities that are threatened or are looking at village relocation. And then we have a modest portion into the other 27 and the other 200. And uh, what I've identified here below is where those funding sources are coming from. Now let's talk about how the Denali Commission does business. So we have six commissioners. They are all Alaskans. They decide the course and the future and the investments. They've met. They've already considered public opinion on environmentally threatened communities. We had a uh, public hearing on March 1st, and then we um, had a, except written comments through March 16th. Those helped influence them on these investments. Now, the Federal Register publication will be up for 30 days, and then we'll take a look at that, and we perhaps may make some changes. I will just be honest with you, more than likely there will be no changes, but this is what's very important. My commissioners are already, we're already in the process of talking about FY17, and comments that we receive now will likely influence FY17. So I truly encourage you to look at the Federal Register website and give us your opinions. Are we on the right path? Are we missing something? anything like that, or if you think we're on the right path, that is also very useful as well. So that was my primary message for today, and I thank um, the conference for allowing me to poach a little bit on Jackie's time. So if you could put up, uh, if you could put up Jackie's, um, oh, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about our scheduled speaker. I turn you all to your book. This is a great book. And you see all the scheduled speakers. She's the one who looks like she's actually working. <laughs> the rest of us, you know, maybe not so much working. But the one here with a helmet on, you know, in a helicopter in the field, that's our guest speaker today. I think that's what you need to know. She's going to tell, tell us a little bit about herself. But before we do, I'll share that um, she got her undergraduate in um, environmental science, water resources, um, and then uh, um, came up here to Fairbanks where she got her master's degree in geologic engineering. I'm an engineer too, so I like that. She's, uh, she grew up in Oregon, so she's from the West Coast, although spent a little bit of time in Florida, and she likes the outdoors. She can, if we have time, she can tell you all about that. But um, I think she's got an exciting um, uh, topic today, talking about tools and issues that uh, pertain to the program I just talked to you about, Environmentally Threatened Communities. So with that, Jackie, would you join us here? Thank you, Joel. I do like the outdoors, which is one of the reasons I uh, didn't really enjoy living in Florida for too long. Um, and why I, I graduated from, from UAF and got a job there and then decided why well, I really want to be in Alaska. Um, that was one of the reasons anyway. So thank you for having me today. Um, I work for the State of Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys managing the Coastal Hazards Program. Uh, the Coastal Hazards Program has been around for about six years and mostly focused on issues of flooding and erosion in western Alaska, um, and, and I'll go into a little bit of why that is, um, doing geohazard mapping and analysis related to uh, topography and, uh, and water levels. So today I'm gonna to talk about shoreline change. It's just one of the things that we do and um, some of the tools that we have available that you might be interested in. And so I'll give you some background. I know we're not coastal scientists here, so don't worry, I'll, I'll set up the terminology for you. Uh, I wanna talk specifically about one location just to show you what goes into our analyses um, at, at each location that we visit and, and what goes into our determination of, of shoreline change and shoreline change rates. Um, and then, of course, talk about the online tools. 
And this is a, the image in the background is of Teller, Alaska, and it's an image from one of our recent data collections uh, in 2015, high resolution ortho imagery and digital surface models, which will be publicly available within the next few weeks. So what is a shoreline? Obviously, shorelines only exist in Hawaii or California or Florida. That's where we wanna go in the wintertime when it's negative 40 here in Fairbanks, if that ever happens again. Uh, <laughs> but what we can see even from this photo is that there's actually some regular lines. Let's see, here we go. Oh, that was the wrong button. That's all right. There's some regular lines along the shoreline. Uh, you can see where the tide reached uh, at its maximum, that wet, dry line. And so that is a, sh a shoreline. Uh, you can see where the water is right now. That's the instantaneous water line. Um, and then there's also some vegetation growing that probably would grow further down, but it, it can't grow in salt water. So there's a vegetation line. Uh, and we, we can see that for this time uh, for this shoreline. So when it comes to delineating shorelines, uh, we, we have to have an idea of where a shoreline is in time so that we can track it through time and understand rates of shoreline change. So where is the shoreline going into the future? Is it eroding? Is it accreting? Uh, and we do that to, through two different types of data sets. Um, the best type of data set is datum-based. So this is an elevation that is associated with a, a tidal datum. Um, and tidal datums are derived from our uh, water level sensors uh, that are tracking tides through time. And that gives us an idea of mean sea level. That might be something you've heard before, the mean high water elevation. Uh, but it's just an elevation on the beach, not necessarily associated with something that you can see. And that's great because we can go to a digital surface model, pick out that elevation, and we know very specifically where that shoreline is. But of course, we don't have digital surface models from 1950 um, and, and even for most parts of the coast of Alaska. So we have other methods as well. And the other way is through feature-based. And like we saw in that first photo, the visible uh, linear shoreline features. So the vegetation line, the wet dry line. And here's even an example on this one coastal environment. So depending on the data that we have, and the coastal setting, we might use a different visible feature to delineate that shoreline. But if we're going to compare it to past shorelines, we have to use that same feature through time. And just to give you an idea of what kind of shoreline products are available for Alaska specifically, um, you can see this is the uh, NOAA's continually updated shoreline product. Uh, this is where the shoreline is today. Um, and there are large parts of Alaska that don't even have a current shoreline. Um, whereas the lower 48, they continually update. So uh, their shorelines are a little more recent. And you may not be able to see very well, but uh, this is the state of Alaska shorelines as um, when they were last defined. So some areas are undefined, some are pre-statehood. Uh, obviously that would make it very difficult to determine a rate of shoreline change if we don't even have a current shoreline. So this is part of what we're working to get done. Uh, the US Geological Survey uh, projects or, or calculates rates of shoreline change um, with their National Assessment of Coastal Change Hazards Group and have shoreline change data available for the entire US, even parts of Puerto Rico, um, and, but only for the North Slope of Alaska. And even if you see in the legend, they have uh, different rates of shoreline change uh, in meters per year. And their maximum is negative two meters per year. You'll see there's a lot of areas on the North Slope that are red and fully saturated because those rates of shoreline change go much past negative two meters per year. So I'm talking with them to see if, if we can get that legend change to, to show people the reality of shoreline change rates in Alaska. And this is the type of data that goes into that. Um, an example from New Jersey where they have seven or eight shoreline positions through time. Um, and in Barrow, which is the uh, most populated area on the North Slope that they covered, which only has two. Uh, so obviously the more shoreline positions we have, the more certain we are of the shoreline change rates um, and, and the better we're able to determine our uncertainty in those rates. And why is this important? 
Um, there are many communities, Joel talked about um, some of the, the environmentally threatened communities, those are all listed in here along with other communities that may be less threatened but we don't really know because uh, we don't have rates of shoreline change, but we do know that they are affected by erosion and flooding or some combination of both. Uh, and this is a lot of communities here. One of the reports identified 184 out of 213, uh, and that includes riverine communities, of course. And why does this concern you? <laughs> Being here at the energy conference. So um, here's an example of some flooding that occurred at Gullivan in 2011. And you can see that the energy infrastructure was right up next to that flooding level. Um, in Shaktulik, over on the right, uh, you can see the energy infrastructure uh, is very close to the shoreline. So if that shoreline is going to move in the near future, uh, you want to know when that shoreline might intersect that infrastructure and whether or not you can defend the infrastructure, move it, when you need to move it, information like that. And so um, working for DGGS, we're located here in Fairbanks, which might be interesting because it's a coastal program and we're not close to the coast at all. Uh, but we're equidistant from all parts of the coast. Should make it easier. Um, and, and like I said before, we, we've been working on investigations um, to understand long-term change as well as hazardous events uh, such as storm surge. And we do that through field investigations um, and remote sensing. So the photo with the, the helicopter helmet on, um, that's just a fun one because helicopters are pretty fun to ride in. Uh, and we go around to, each, to individual communities and do in-depth analysis at these communities. Um, and then of course our remote sensing products, uh, are, we're able to uh, determine rates of shoreline change and uh, flood vulnerability for a much broader area than we might be able to collect uh, in the field. We also do investigation of water levels and uh, here's some examples, uh, collecting bathymetry, uh, putting up real-time water level sensors that are continuously feeding back uh, to us at our office. And in the upper left, uh, Alex is surveying in a flood elevation that someone marked on a pole um, from a long time ago, and, and now we have that elevation available to us. So what we're really doing is, you know, I'm a coastal scientist, and I am interested in the natural processes of the coast. Um, throughout Alaska. And these natural processes are occurring all the time, but only when they come in contact with a valued system do they turn into a hazard. So there's an overwash deposit south of Shaktulik. No one really cared about that or noticed it happen. And then, of course, from Hurricane Sandy on the New Jersey coast, people noticed that it caused a lot of problems. It cost a lot of money. Um, and, and a community or a city's ability to uh, assess those hazards and um, identify their vulnerability leads to whether or not they are at risk to such hazards. So I will talk about the natural processes. And a, a preliminary report was completed by Nicole Kinsman and Alexander Gould. This is all of their work and I'm here to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I've, I've helped out in a lot of investigations at DGGS throughout the years, uh, but I did miss out on this one, unfortunately. So Port Hyden is located in Bristol Bay and um, is, is associated, oh, I don't have, I don't have my. So you can see that Port Hyden is actually located a little bit further inland. There is uh, their old village site, Meshik. Uh, which is still on the coastline and is subject to coastal erosion. And so what that means is there is a lot of infrastructure that is either already eroding into the coastline or has potential to erode into the coastline or into the, into the ocean um, and cause uh, future problems. So a DGGS field investigation includes high-grade GPS survey. We go out with uh, a GPS and get sub-centimeter elevations of the beach and uh, an oblique aerial photo collection so you can have a visible idea 
of, of what's going on. Um, and if you look at those through time, you can uh, examine change. We also take a look at the sediment uh, content of the beaches, uh, the, any historical aerial photos. So I talked a little bit about that, but looking back into, into history and seeing what kind of photos were collected over these regions. Um, we also work to, uh, to look at historical events and then um, if there have been any local environmental observations, those are also very helpful um, in, in determining what the drivers of coastal change are. So here's our coastal setting. The tidal energy, you may not be able to see it. So tidal energy is increasing as it's going into the bay and wave energy is decreasing in these areas where wave energy dominates. We have uh, large beaches and barrier island systems where tidal uh, energy dominates. We have more of a riverine environment. And so Port Hyden is kind of in the middle of those and a combination of both, of course, can't make it easy. And then we also have uh, previous reports that document erosion at the site, and they're of varying different types of, of, of reporting. So one says uh, approximately 20 feet of bank was eroded uh, with resultant property damage. So that's good to know, property eroded into the ocean. However, 20 feet of erosion, was that 20 feet back or 20 feet along the bank? We don't know, and so we need to look into into other forms of data in order to actually get a rate of shoreline change. So here are the oblique aerial photos, and just from looking at these, you can see that certain pieces of infrastructure are closer to the ocean than they used to be. So we're lucky enough to have data from 2006 and 2013. Uh, in some locations, we only have one data set, of course. And in the future, if there's a large storm, we can go back and, and take aerial photos again and see what kind of damages occur. Uh, so we also did, looked at the sediment and um, found that it's mostly volcanic material, so it's very loose and it's very light. If waves come in contact with that, they will erode very quickly. Um, and we did that at alongshore coastal profiles, uh, or crossshore coastal profiles. So a coastal profile is uh, when we're taking our elevations from land to beach. And, and get an idea of the topography between those. If we do that at enough locations along the shoreline, then we can get an idea of where sediment is moving um, and, and what beach volume and beach uh, slope is like. So those are all important things. Uh, and those coastal profiles were collected at all of those locations on that map on the right. Um, and recollections were made uh, at the blue profiles. So they were able to go back after a storm event and remeasure some of these profiles. Uh, this is some of the information we gained from the local environmental observations. So this is the, the LEO network, which is funded by the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Someone has, can just download an app on your phone, become an environmental observer, and then go and take pictures before or after an event um, and, and document the changes that are occurring. So uh, they documented that this fuel header here became much more exposed after a storm in 2013 and also kind of tracked through time how that fuel header was doing. So that's really important if your fuel header is eroding into the ocean, right? You wanna know that and you wanna know at what rate that's happening. And then here's some more photos of uh, during storm events uh, and seeing the kind of flooding that's occurring, seeing the wave action that's reaching those uh, volcanic materials and, and eroding them away. So here's our cross shore profile in a plot. Uh, so these are elevations and the ocean is on the left, land is on the right. And um, from we, our initial observations were in August of 2013 and then after the storm uh, they were able to visit in October of 2013 and that was 6.2 meters of bluff erosion. That is incredible for one event. Um, so this erosion is really an issue here and um, just due to, to one storm event. Now, if we look at these aerial photographs through time, um, and, and what we've done is, is delineated the shoreline within each of these photos. So go into a GIS system, delineate the shoreline, and then compare those through time. But even just looking at the photos, you can see in 1957, there's a very large island offshore, and as time goes on, it, uh, it gets drowned out. 
and actually that sediment is moving to the north and welding to a spit on the other side. So uh, in a location where it may have been previously protected by that island, uh, it's now uh, exposed to wave activity and storms. And here's an example of those shorelines. So you can see that uh, island there moves inland and then welds to the north. So what has that done to shoreline change rates? Uh, these are our long-term uh, shoreline change rates and their uncertainty. So we take all of the shorelines that we've measured through those photos and determine a rate for, uh, from all of those. And you can see it's variable. In some locations, it could be positive or negative. Uh, and in other locations, it's strongly negative or eroding. And most closely to Goldfish Lake there. And if we just look at a few of these, uh, a few transects and the shoreline change rates at those transects, um, we can see some changes through time. So these are the shoreline change rates between each shoreline position. Um, we're able to determine a rate of change, obviously, from one time to the next. So we start off with actual relative stability in the shoreline. Uh, and then around 1986, there is a sharp decrease um, in the shoreline rate, so uh, going towards erosion, um, which is about when that island shifted to the north. So what do we get from this analysis? Um, this loose, there's loose erodible sediment along with uh, infrastructure and um, different kind of garbage and stuff that, that's on this shoreline uh, that's getting eroded away due to these changing offshore conditions. Um, and, and the rate of erosion has increased through time due to these changes. So what does this mean? Um, what, what we can do is take those rates of shoreline change and actually project into the future where the shoreline might be. So we have uh, the Alaska Shoreline Change Tool, and it's only available in a few places right now. We're working to make it more regionally available, uh, but that means going back and orthorectifying uh, historical aerial imagery, delineating shorelines, uh, calculating the rates of shoreline change, and then projecting them into the future. So a lot of work goes into this. Um, but we do have them in some places, Port Hyden, Unalakleet, uh, Wales, Kivalina, um, and then we also have the shorelines from the U.S. Geological Survey that went into the rates of shoreline change that they also have on their website. So if we look at Port Hyden specifically, uh, these are the different shorelines through time. Um, and, you know, they may look like, oh, it's speeding up, it's slowing down. No, uh, we just have more data in current time. And so that's why all those shoreline positions are closer together uh, in the near future, or um, in recent time. And so from these shorelines, the rate of shoreline change sort of on an, an average, it's a, little, it's a little different from an average, but it, we can just call it an average now. Uh, then we project into 2020, where that shoreline might be, 2025, and 2030. And obviously, these shoreline change rates aren't going to stay consistent through time. They're going to become more variable with climate change. And of course, once this lake breaches, then who knows what's going to happen. But at least we have an idea of when that might happen, a little bit of our uncertainty in, in when that will happen, and, and we can use this as a planning tool into the future. And then we also have the coastal profiles available online in the coastal profile tool, consistent with our naming scheme. Uh, and so the coastal profiles are available for viewing online. You can click on an individual profile, and it might only have one data set, but it might have more. Um, and then that same plot that we looked at before is available along with some photos. Um, what's great about the coastal profile tool is that's actually something that we can incorporate into uh, community-based observations. So if we go out and um, measure the a coastal profile initially, uh, we can set up a stake and, and actually have people go out with a couple of sticks and a string and, and measure um, uh, the coastal profile after that. And, our GPS equipment broke one time when we were in Nome, and, and we decided that we were going to go ahead and try this out, and, it, and sure enough, it worked. So uh, we're, we're working on incorporating that into some educational programs. So um, we've, we've done that in Yakutat, and those are some of the example profiles that we automatically update our online tool with. 
And of course, into the future, we're going to be processing more data, incorporating more data into our, uh, into our tool, trying to get a statewide, um, statewide uh, data set available and make projections everywhere. Um, and then we also want to add more baseline data sets to our coastal profile tool and establish uh, a more community-based efforts um, so because my staff is not very big and so we can't go out to every community all the time. And if people are interested in, in coastal change um, from a local perspective, then, then we want to help facilitate that. And there's an example of our, uh, our website and all of the different uh, types of analyses that we do but I'll just give you my contact information. And um, do we have time for a couple questions? Robert. I'll take, yeah, yeah. a couple questions? Yes. yes. There's a question right up here, Robert. Thanks, I was curious about your reference toward the end at what I might call citizen science. Um, is there a more concentrated effort that you're leading or that anyone is aware of for this local scientific data collection? Yeah, so uh, it's definitely something we're trying to incorporate into all of our field activities. So um, depending on interest from communities, if they come to us and ask for it, I will absolutely help facilitate that. Um, but it, we're also working with Alaska Sea Grant on a different project that is focused solely on community-based efforts. Um, and so we'll be doing that around Bristol Bay this summer and into next year as well. Um, and that, that project uses some time-lapse photography along with some of these methods um, for, for people to monitor coastal change. Question on uh, the projection of uh, either erosion or accretion on the uh, coastline. Um, does that, is that mainly driven by the exposure to wave energy and other variables like that, or is that also taking into account um, the projections on sea level rise? Right, so we're taking actual physical shorelines and using those to project into the future. So the processes that are forcing those um, aren't necessarily taken into account in our model, uh, but, but they are taken into account in the historical rates of change. So the more shorelines that we can incorporate into the model, of course, will make for better projections. Um, and into the future, we are looking to start doing things like looking at Port Hyden, where you have a sharp decrease in shoreline change, maybe we don't want to take into account those certain historical shorelines in our projection, because that's not what the state of, of the shoreline is right now. Question over here. Hello. I want to ask about the barrel data you guys have. I, I noticed you guys had some just data back to 2010. So a little bit of history when I was growing up there, there used to be a point there between Barrow and Briarville, no longer there, nobody knows about it. Uh, when I was growing up, the beach was, I would say, quarter mile to a half mile where it is now. So I'm just wondering if uh, anyone in your group or, or somewhere has been sent up to try to get some historical verbal data where the shore used to be. Right, so um, one way that, that we incorporate that kind of information is um, if we're out in the field and we're able to take a measurement, say, you know, where a storm reached or um, add, add on, you know, th at this location there should be a cliff 20 feet out in, in front of us. Um, we, we definitely want to document that information and we're working on how we incorporate that into our online tools and, and things like that. I haven't personally done a lot of work in Barrow because there are other research projects that do, but um, they, I mean, they would love to get more information, I'm sure, about past environments and documenting that. Okay, one more question. So when you're installing instrumentation to measure water levels, are you also um, interested in installing ground temperature monitoring so that you can get some idea on how fast the permafrost is degrading and how that might impact the change on the shoreline over time and the erosion rates? So that is a part of some research projects that are, are happening in Alaska. Uh, the USGS has a field project in Kaktovik on Barter Island and they're installing temperature sensors um, next month. 
um, and they I think they've had them there in the past. So in, in really permafrost rich areas, that's obviously very important. Um, and but in western Alaska, you know, you kind of the further south you move, the less permafrost you have. So uh, we haven't incorporated that into our field projects yet. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jackie and Joel. Uh, round of applause. <laughs>